Good afternoon. Zach Glass is an artist and theorist whose work engages technology, queerness, and politics. His teaching and research interests include contemporary art and activism, media theory, science and technology studies, queer and feminist theory, visual cultures, political philosophy, and critical theory. Currently, Blas is producing a body of artwork that responds to technological control and refusals of political visibility through tactics of escape, disappearance, illegibility, and opacity. One project, Facial Weaponization Suite, produces collective masks in a community-based workshops that cannot be detected as human faces by biometric facial recognition technologies. Another, Contra Internet, explores the aesthetics and political subversions of the internet and other neoliberal network digital technologies. Blas is also producing two books, Escaping the Face, an artist monograph of recent works to be published by Rizom at the New Museum, and Informatic Opacity, Biometric Facial Recognition and the Aesthetics and Politics of Defacement, solicited by Duke University Press, a theoretical study that considers biometric facial recognition as an emergent form of global governance alongside aesthetical political refusals of recognition such as mass protest. Blas has exhibited and lectured internationally, most recently at Museo Universitario Arte Contemporaneo, Mexico City. Blas holds a PhD from the graduate program in literature at Duke University and a MFA in design media arts from UCLA, and is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Art at the University at Buffalo. Misha Cardenas can be described as an artist, theorist, student, educator, mixed race Latina femme who works with movement as a technology of change. She is currently a PhD candidate and provost fellow at the University of Southern California in the Media Arts and Practice program. She received her MFA at the University of California, San Diego, and she holds a master's degree in media and communications with distinction from the European Graduate School and a bachelor's degree in computer science from Florida International University. Misha Cardenas is also a member of Electronic Disturbance Theater 2.0. Misha's individual and collaborative work has been seen in museums, galleries, biennials, and keynotes around the world. Her co-authored book, The Trans Real, Political Aesthetics of Crossing Realities was published by Atropos Press in 2012. Zach Blass describes Misha's work in Trans Desire as offering us nothing less than a practical theory of desire that creates livable, affirmative worlds that resist the violence of capitalism and heteronormativity. We invite you to help us welcome Zach Blass and Misha Cardenas to the Monroe Center for Social Inquiry and to Pitzer College. In a 2009 article entitled Afterlife, Dianima and Unhuman Politics, media theorist Eugene Thacker writes, if our global context of climate change, disasters, pandemics, or complex networks tells us anything, it is that political thought today demands a concept of life adequate to its anonymous unhuman dimensions, an unhuman politics for unhuman life. Thacker's use of the unhuman here alludes to the strange worlds and weird lives that reveal themselves by turning toward the emergent, unexpected, and challenging interactions and engagements between the human and the non-human. So this afternoon, I'm going to suggest that perhaps the virus might be a good place to start for a queer unhuman politics. 
Thacker's call for an unhuman politics arises in a swarm of viral hype. Everything has seemingly gone viral. Alongside continuous panics of viral outbreaks, there are also fears of vaccine shortages. The rise of PC computer viruses are fought with antivirus security software. And justice philosophers Michael Hart and Antonio Negri have described the New World Order's institutional structure like a software program that carries a virus along with it so that it is continuously modulating and corrupting the institutional forms around it. There is now viral marketing, viral advertising, and viral media to aid, support, and propagate this structure. Concurrently, the emergence of theories like viral ecology, viral philosophy, viral capitalism, viral politics, viral affect, and viral aesthetics to diagnose our culture today suggests that the virus is surely a major trope of our contemporary condition. This virus-viral relation looms as an exemplar for considering Thacker's unhuman politics. As the non-human virus comes to bear multifariously upon the human, in part through the human naming or classification of what is permitted to be considered viral. So a crucial point here, what a virus is and does cannot only be extracted into the qualifier viral just as the qualities of the viral cannot be reduced to the virus. So to think the virus and the viral is to engage in their continuous states of flux, transformation, and movements toward in between, as well as diversions away from one another, attending to the fact that there is some kind of recognition or identification process that binds or links the virus and viral together for the human. So the virus is difficult to conceptualize, not only because it can exist in so many material substrates, um, and is constantly changing, but also because the virus historically produces different generations of itself that operate in greater or lesser degrees of complexity in both biological and computational forms. So thus a dizzying array of viralities have emerged and continue to rapidly proliferate. The viral has indeed gone viral. So I understand the viral uh, to emphasize a break or rupture between fiction and reality that is hazy, fluid, and unstable. Imitations of the virus, commonly labeled viral, are more like creative openings into the fictions or poetics of the virus. These framings of the virus are unhuman, and unhuman politics is a framing for the examination of the overlappings, differences, and irreducibilities, or perhaps mediations, of the virus and the viral. So what are our viral politics today? While media theorists Alexander Galloway and Eugene Thacker have written that viruses and diseases are obviously not to be looked at as models for progressive political action, our contemporary thought and artistic practice constantly and consistently looks there. Galloway and Thacker suggest that the virus is a product of globalization and conquest as well as computer security and digital control is a dead end for radical politics. Yet political art collectives like Venus Matrix and the Electronic Disturbance Theater use the virus as a queer feminist anti-capitalist tactic. So if these groups create a notion of the virus-viral relation that does not simply coincide with capitalism, are there other possibilities for radical viral politics today? So today I will explore, and Misha will kind of intersect with this, um, two different axes of the virus-viral relation. So I will look from a virus to viral based on action or replication in cryptography, which is the most common usage of viral today, what Galloway and Thacker call the becoming number of the virus. And then the second axis of virus viral is based on evasion through a consideration of the viral as a framework for escaping forms of recognition control, such as biometric technologies. Turn the lights down on the stage for this next video.
For your protection and the protection of others, please put on your N95 mask and latex gloves now. You walk into a room with a table full of instruments, full of instruments covered in iridescent dust, very old instruments from the 2030s, some broken into shards of glass and others burnt. Here in this laboratory, before the myth of rigid national borders was eradicated by the H3N91 mutations, artists experimented with their bodies, applying a do-it-yourself and do-it-together ethos to medical science. Amidst the collapse of information capitalism, new ways out of the religious dogma of Western rational science were rediscovered and reinvented. The sound of your breath is loud inside your mask. It's unclear what viruses were found here or not. Approaching a piece of paper on the table half buried in dust, the faulty nanoscale photon networks flicker into motion, forming most of an image of an encoded memory. Once the Chicano Coyotec gang got us past La Linea, we ran. We knew the CAM bots could tell that we were aroused from our ECG and EEG information data networks. We trained ourselves to control our heart rates and brain waves so as to be undetected. But the pheromone sensors embedded throughout the city of Los Angeles were sure to track us. I've witnessed CAM bots transfer sibyls suspicious of being infected to the federal penitentiary. The photon networks run out of fuel from the tiny bit of amino acid still in the paper and the image flickers out. Hyper aware of your physical safety, you see a bit of glass on your latex glove and step back, quickly shaking it off. Responding to your step, another table is showered in the cold blue of overhead LEDs, with nothing on it but a single clean sheet of paper. Stepping up to it, you pick up the paper and accidentally activate the memory replay device. Everything around you spins for a moment. You see flashes before your eyes. There's a slight tingle above your right ear as your old neural implant is activated. A scene unfolds before your eyes, and you hear the voice embedded in the recorded memory. The nanobio interface has taken control of your somatosensory cortex, perfectly recreates this mem, a digitized memory. She's testing me now. My heartbeats are spread open across the screen. The graph jumps up and down with my breath as she moves her instrument up and down my body, connecting the conductive thread, the low droning pitch modulating over the repeating sound of our recorded voices, testing for viral contamination. I breathe more heavily in and out in a circle through my stomach, my heart, neck, activating my body for her, preparing for the next phase of testing. Laying on the operating table, I manage to slip open her zipper to reveal her nipple. I know that she knows, but she stands firm in her mission. We must learn about our bodies to escape the control of those who claim to know better than we do. Again, the scene spins. You feel the neural tingle above the straps holding your mask on and you're back in the lab. Confused, you're breathing deep and your heart is beating loudly in your ears. You walk around to the other side of the table with the instruments. Above the instruments, a three-dimensional image flickers into view. We are creating femme disturbance. Our corsets, thigh highs, metal sex toys, and finely crafted glass dildos are not necessary for capitalist production and feminized immaterial labor, and their presence disturbs the rational drive of the work ethic that demands that we sacrifice our desires in a time of crisis. Our desire for each other's femme bodies is an excess of the rhetorics of medical control. Our desire to see each other naked exceeds the laws preventing us from doing so. Our queer femme expression disturbs the rigid masculinist structures of science, medicine, and capital. Together, we are engaging in a femme science to develop new modes of knowledge outside the limited strictures of corporate-driven medicine, using our desire and cheap handmade electronics to create our own medicine to learn about our bodies outside of the bounds of our heteropatriarchal world. Using biometric monitors, instead of quantification and distance observation, we create a deeper intimacy with each other. Moments of interdependence and intersubjectivity. We've inherited a world with thousands of years of science and thought shaped primarily by men, where queer and femme knowledge has been viciously stamped out by Western medicine, and yet the very time and space we inhabit are not the same as theirs. So now, we will create our own worlds of knowledge with our own bodies. 
Femme here is an affect, more than an emotion. It's a combination of sensations and desires that drives us. We're inspired by Lisa Dugan and Kathleen McHugh's call for a femme science that is addressed to the future. A future where femininity as we know it, normal, egoless, tolerant of and therefore complicit with deception, will have been completely superseded. We are pulling these future realities into our own and letting the resulting disturbances to the laws of physics multiply and proliferate. Our fashion will tear apart the established order, literally and figuratively. We reappropriate the objects of clothing which are thought to make up femininity, buying them from sex shops and then deconstructing them, cutting them open, rewiring them with our own conductive thread and sensors to create new queer modes of sexual connection and expression. We buy panties, bras, thigh highs, and choke collars and turn them into new DIY sex toys. An ultrasonic rangefinder bra, a pressure sensitive choking collar, a touch sensitive dress, an emotion sensitive glove that controls a strap on vibrator. By reconstructing the meaning of science, medicine, femme, love, and community, we can survive in a world of biopolitical power out of control, a world that tries to kill us every day. The voices stop. The laboratory overwhelms your somatosensory cortex, creating a schizophrenic space. You run towards the door to escape the virus circus. You're stopped by text hovering inside the door, seeming to block your way for a moment. Virus Circus follows the viral as a transversal line of inquiry that intersects with the militarization of medical authority, microscopic transnational migrations, and global economic inequality, consisting of an episodic series of performances using wearable electronics, soft sensors, and live audio to bridge virtual and physical spaces. The performances explore, explore queer futures of latex sexuality and DIY medicine amidst a speculative world of virus hysteria. The history of queer politics shows that the rhetoric of viruses such as HIV are used to control marginalized populations, while viruses such as H1N1 reproduce these structures of power. You run out and find your body. Virus Viral 1, Action. Representations of the virus viral today typically hinge on rapid spreadability and mutation. In fact, wherever one looks, the virus has gained the most attention through its abilities to replicate and disseminate. From SARS, H1N1, and Ebola to the latest computer virus or meme, the virus is commonly perceived as that which quickly generates copies of itself and infectiously breaks through barriers or quarantines. In line with this perspective, Alex Galloway and Eugene Thacker, two theorists who have writ written extensively on viruses, state that the virus is life exploiting life. That is, viruses take advantage of their host entities to generate more copies of themselves. The virus succeeds in producing its copies through a process Galloway and Thacker refer to as never being the same. Maintaining within itself the ability to continuously mutate its code with each reproduction, the virus propagates itself. Defining the virus based on action, they write, replication and cryptography are thus the two activities that define the virus. What counts is not the host, what, what counts is not that the host is a bacterium, an animal, or a human. What counts is the code, the number of the animal, or better, the numerology of the animal. The viral perspective is cryptographic because it replicates this difference, this paradoxical status of never being the same. What astounds us is that the viral perspective presents the animal being and creaturely life in an illegible and incalculable manner, a matter of chthonic calculations and occult replications. Galloway and Thacker conclude by claiming this becoming number of the virus is its identity. So this conception of the virus as that which is solely concerned with replication and mutation is generative of what has become known as viral today. It seems that everything has gone viral based on this dominant understanding of the virus as a becoming number. Particularly in social media, the viral is representative of the virus as replication. For something to go viral in social media platforms only requires things to spread within a system or network, not necessarily replicate with a difference. So this is similarly the, similarly the case with viral marketing as well. 
When social media stresses the replication and spreadability of the virus and ignores its mutating, never being the sameness, current theorizations of capitalism focus on both the replication and mutation of the virus. Media theorist UC Parika takes heart in Negri's assertion that capitalism is like a virus even further in his own writings on viral capitalism. He notes that capitalism is now viral and that it is capable of continuous modulation and heterogenesis. The commodity, he writes, works as a virus, and the virus part of the commodity circuit. Viral capitalism replicates itself through a mutating act of never being the sameness, that is, it continuously modulates and reproduces to maintain a global infection. Viral capitalism is another gesture toward theorizing our phase of control capitalism, which has many other names. Looted capitalism, empire, protocological control, Deleuzean capitalism, and digital and liquid capitalism, all underscoring unstable, rapid fluxes of unhuman flows that induce a general commodification of life itself. Viral capitalism highlights the infectious nature of this multiplicitous morphing control process. So it's easy enough to argue that today's viral hype is a fictional relation to or break from the virus, creating a poetics or distortion of its movement and action. Perhaps this viral is rightly dominant because its focus on speedy replication and mutation is at the heart of contemporary capital, neoliberalism, and globalization. So now I'll quickly talk through um, the first body of artwork I made when I was pursuing um, this line of viral research, which is a project called Queer Technologies that I made uh, within the span of 2007 to 2012. And I understood this work to have a viral aesthetics. And the way that I understood that was um, I basically made a set of critical products. And these were artworks that were designed to look like products. So they could circulate far and wide beyond the art world. So there is um, a taking up of the commodity and replicating it with a difference and able to circulate within consumer outlets and various other settings beyond the museum. And that's how I understood this viral aesthetics. It's kind of like a critical mimicking that allows it, that allows the work to replicate and spread far. So um, the work was designed to, or the Queer Technologies was designed to function like an art group, a political collective, and a company. And we would produce things like Transcoder, which was um, a queer programming language, like trying to ask like what would um, a queer programming look like when there's a history of queer slang language. And so this was designed as a software, um, you see it was pr mass produced with software boxes, and um, these are like the different programming structures that were created, this kind of imaginative queer code functions that you could use and program with. And then um, Electronic Disturbance Theater is one of the artists that eventually took up the transcoder programming language and, and wrote some stuff with it for their project Transborder Immigrant Tool. Another uh, part of the Queer Technologies Project is engendering gender changers, which is you know, thinking about why are electrical plugs gendered male and female based on pinhole configuration. And so this was producing you know, a whole other set of um, you know, plugs right, with like, um, playing with pinhole configuration going beyond male and female. And you know, here's like a kind of example of just like, you know, thinking about um, how it's so easy to sexualize plugs you know, based on the dominant understanding of whether they're male or female. So, Right, like these are the kind of things I would do, and then I hacked apart these gender changers from Radio Shack and put them back together, and so you can see, like, here's the critical mimicking I was talking about. You can see the Radio Shack one on the left, and the Queer Technologies one on the right. And then these were shop dropped in consumer electronic stores like Radio Shack or Best Buy or Ta Target or Walmart or the Apple Store. And the last in this was Gay Bombs, which was this um, software, it was designed to be a software manual, but it's thinking about this US military weapon that was in development that was actually a biochemical weapon that would be that would turn enemy combat combatants gay. So um, it was kind of this bizarre logic of gay shame and this was actually a weapon that was in development. But I'm also thinking about this other bomb on the left that was dropped on Afghanistan in I think 2001 or no, maybe 2003 and just kind of like on the one hand, this is about associating, you know, kind of terrorist others with the, with the name FAG, but then with the military bomb, and here's the actual military proposal, um, and it was later, you know, written about excessively in the news, thinking about how the military appropriates homosexuality as a weapon for the nation state. So this was kind of like exploring all of this, and you can see it's designed to look exactly like a software manual, read like one. Any good software manual has its set of charts and diagrams, so these are some of those. 
And um, also we would do demonstrations just like Steve Jobs would demo a new Apple product or operating system. There would be performances on how to use these products. And then um, there was also, for installations, there was also this thing called the disingenuous bar that we made, which was a play on Apple's genius bar and thinking about you know, the deeply politicized conflation of who's helping you at the Apple store, what kind of knowledge they're giving you and not giving you, and what does it mean to conceptualize that as a genius. So we created this kind of playful performative space called the disingenuous bar that kind of looked like an Apple boutique and a store, but there would be people performing in these spaces and you would have a really different kind of engagement with technological knowledge and the last bit was that we would just circulate false information about stores and boutiques that were opening up in really fancy neighborhoods in Los Angeles like on the Third Street Promenade or the Beverly Center So this is an image of a uh, two-spirited black Mohawk artist from Toronto, and I'll talk about her work a little bit. Uh, fields such as media studies, speculative and critical design have had a tendency to use concepts from the experiences of marginalized people without considering the actual experiences of those same people. Vivian Namaste described this in her book, Invisible Lives, operating when queer theorists use transgender and transsexual people as a metaphor for gender transgression without considering the lived realities or needs of trans people. In contrast, her work on H and AIDS and HIV demonstrates the ways that the concept of transgender is produced by both the medical establishment, social support services, and academics by interviewing HIV-positive francophone trans people and practicing post what she calls post-structural reflexive sociology. Considering that disability studies seeks to understand the social construction and management of illness and wellness, the HIV virus is an often discussed example in disability studies. Mel Chen writes, disability scholars have discussed the deployment of disability as a trope that ultimately reconsolidates ability. David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder have elucidated the idea of narrative prosthesis, a kind of narrative deployment of disability that entrenches a kind of ableist idealization of privileged subject positions. The concept of prosthetic was widely discussed in new media theory and art in the 1990s, with very little of this writing coming from people who use prosthetic devices on a daily basis. Much writing about the concept of virus and the viral may replicate this pattern. That's a question I have for you all to think about over this series. Of being done by people who don't have the experience of being seen as pathological or sick based on their gender, race, or ability. My argument is not to say that we should only write about our own experiences, but that theorists, artists, and designers have a responsibility to be accountable to the social realities of the concepts they use and to the communities who are described by their concepts. I propose that a disability studies approach is useful here as well as a transgender studies approach to deepen our understanding of virus and the viral. Unfortunately, Ilnana is a community-based arts group that doesn't have a lot of really good documentation of their work. So um, this performance by Jelani um, about the stigma of having HIV and being HIV positive, um, this is like the one, one minute clip that I could find. <laughs> um, but I do have some more images of it. Black trans women are the fastest growing population of new HIV cases in the US. 
They're 49%, 49 times more likely than other women to have HIV, and 53% of black trans women have HIV. This demonstrates the ways that multiple intersecting oppressions operate to create a situation of extreme precarity. Part of why this persists is because of the lack of, lack of medical research on trans people and the lack of documentation. Often medical forms only have male or female as gender options, so few statistics exist. Without existing research, the NIH is reluctant to provide funding for particular groups. But these recent studies are helping to bring light to this issue. At the same time, the NYPD often criminalizes trans women for carrying condoms, searching them because of their gender appearance, and then arresting them for being sex workers based on the presence of having condoms, which further exacerbates the situation. So what can be seen here is an example of necropolitics. Oh, gosh. Come back. What can be seen here is an example of necropolitics. Akhil Mbembe proposed the concept of necropolitics as a global south perspective in response to Foucault's biopolitics. While biopolitics described the promise of governance as managing populations in order to, give, to keep them alive, right? the promise of life is what allows governments to continue to reign. Necropolitics describes our contemporary situation in which governments both work to keep certain populations alive and to keep other populations have to have the guarantee of death. The case of HIV positive trans women who are often sex workers or formerly incarcerated women demonstrates the way that contemporary governments kill through neglect. Necropolitical neglect relies also on the neglect of activists, academics, feminists, and social movements to also neglect these populations. In contrast, I would propose a trans of color feminism that can account for the forms of violence faced by trans women of color. This is a task for everyone, and solutions to the HIV epidemic among trans women of color should be a high pri priority for feminists and LGBT activists. Here, one also sees the peculiar optics of necropolitics, because carrying the HIV virus is something that's not visible, yet it's one marker which makes one's life possibilities greatly restricted. I would suggest that these necropolitical optics may also be paralleled in com the computer viruses that are called malware, that recent Snowden documents have documented that the NSA has created, uh, has whole departments to create malware or viruses in order to conduct and monitor international cyber attacks. These malware remained invisible for years, but now people are starting to know about their existence. In order to respond to this situation, trans women of color such as Ms. Major of the Transgender Intersex Justice Project have called on LGBT activists to make the lives of trans women of color a priority. I propose that theorists writing about trans women of color can learn from the survival strategies they're already using while working to challenge the historical lack of voices of trans women, people of color, disabled people, and HIV positive people in theory, design, and art. If we want to understand viruses, I propose we should listen to communities who live intimately with them on a daily basis. Virus Viral 2, Escape. If the virus itself is something politically ambiguous, then the human determination of what is viral generates political, poetic, and ethical schemas. These are the stakes of the unhuman dimension. How the virus is represented to the world through the viral has social repercussions. The extraction of qualities of the virus and their application to various things in the world reminds us that our present is an age of biometric capture and far-reaching standardization processes. Galloway and Thacker have written that the next century, in the 21st century, will be the era of universal standards of identification. Henceforth, the lived environment will be divided into identifiable zones and non-identifiable zones, and non-identifiables will be the shadowy new criminal classes, those that do not identify. 
And the political philosopher Giorgio Agamben has argued something similar um, in his The Coming Community. A being radically devoid of any representable identity would be absolutely irrelevant to the state. What are the techniques for such a practice? What are the problematics for such a practice? And what must be done to resist standardizations of recognition and identity capture that have severe political consequences? All virals are captures, identifications, and yet the virus always escapes us. What if we return to Galloway and Thacker's previous claim that the virus presents life in an illegible and incalculable manner and focus on a viral that might derive from this as that which continuously escapes identity rather than abstract processes of continuous transformation? Can we think unhuman identity as an illegible, incalculable multiplicity? something that has a presence but aids in processes of cloaking, escaping, all through a shifting, altering physical volume? Is there a cryptography composed of both action and affect, which is, affect is another uh, virus viral relation that I didn't talk about tonight, um, that could be framed as viral politics? Is the viral dimension another tactic to critically evade recognition control while maintaining a poetic and political never being the sameness? So um, now I'm going to talk about a project that I've recently completed. And what I'll say about this is that um, this work kind of grew out of the queer technologies work. And this way of conceptualizing the virus was very much a part of this work. But this is a point where I really ended up in the end moving away from the virus as a conceptual schema. And um, I think about this work in a really different way. But it's just important to kind of understand that you know queer technologies is kind of where I um, came into the viral as a um, very productive uh, conceptual framework, and this project is kind of where the viral lingered at the beginning, that, but then um, left in the end. Um, so this work is about making masks in community-based workshops that are about um, to uh, evade biometric facial recognition. And you know, maybe some of you are familiar with biometrics. These are uh, technologies like facial recognition, iris scans, fingerprints, right? which are becoming immensely popular around the world as a form of governance and control and policing. So I did a body of work um, that really focused specifically on the face and facial recognition and how biometrics are basically developing a completely different way and propagating this in a very kind of, at this point, almost everyday sense of what a face means, right? Um, biometrics teach us that a face is a surface code that can be fully quantified in a matter of microseconds. So um, within this issue of biometrics, you know, uh, Misha just brought up right, the problematic of the NSA and surveillance, but I was very much uh, more interested initially with biometrics, not as being um, complicit with global surveillance, but about biometrics as developing a form of identification standardization that's trying to achieve a, a global status. So this is about you know, how do you account for a face, a fingerprint, an iris, um, at a global scale, right? How do, how do we develop a technology that is able to identify a face the exact same way globally? So this is a problematic of identification standardization. And you know, as you, um, you know, do research on biometrics, you realize that because of this kind of standardization, the people that are the most structurally impacted you know, in a negative way are a broad set of minoritarian people. So um, I developed a set of masks and I was really interested in the mask, in uh, the popularity of mask protests as I was studying biometrics. It seemed that as the biometrics industry began to boom, there was this coterminous rise of the popularity of mask protests with social movements. And in the context of masking with social movements, you can think of the mask as not just um, an individual desire to hide one's identity. I mean, of course that is there, hiding one's identity from a camera or a police officer, but it's also about coming together as a collective and experiencing a certain form of collective transformation and demanding to be looked at in a way that can't be reduced to biometric, the biometric gaze, which is also connected to forms of political visibility and representation within democracy. So I would uh, run workshops scan a group of people's faces, and we would develop these masks that were like a composite of everyone's 3D data, which is what you saw an animation of. And then we would wear these masks and do certain performances, interventions, actions. The first mask I made was in Los Angeles. It was called the Fag Face Mask, and it was responding to a set of studies um, conducted in various science labs at universities throughout the US and Europe about how you can supposedly determine whether someone is gay or straight by rapid exposure to their face. And I um, led this action at Gay Pride a couple years ago in um, LA. 
And I kind of replicated this gay face study and made people go through it. And you know, we would scan people's face and tell them if they had gay face or not, basically to make them kind of like performatively go through the absurdity of that scientific experiment. And um, another mask was dealing with different ideas of blackness and darkness. So um, this was made at UC San Diego in Ricardo Dominguez's lab. And this was about thinking about there's a paradox or a really complicated knot of blackness in relation to biometrics where um, biometrics time and time always fail to detect dark skin. And this can lead to you know, serious political precarity if you're not recognized because biometrics are you know, attached to certain forms of governance. So from a racial perspective, this brings up you know, issues of structural racism. But at the exact same time, black, from an informatic perspective, is what allows one to evade detection. So here you have this irresolvable knot, right, of thinking about black from informatic escape and right from racial subjugation. So this mask was about exploring those, and we, we um, this is what the workshops looked like. And then um, this is 3D model of the mask, which is then fabricated through CNC milling and vacuum forming. And then we developed a set of tableau vivants, which were rather abstract about these different ideas of blackness by uh, doing theater of the oppressed um, techniques. A third mask was made at I-Beam in New York City, and this was engaging with feminism and its relationships to recognition and visibility. And um, this ended in a conversation performance um, in New York. And then a final mask was made this past summer in Mexico City at the Museum WAC. And there we developed a, um, a procession throughout Mexico City thinking about how Mexico City and Mexican culture has a, right, an interesting relation to uh, mask protest or um, mask uh, procession, but then you know, kind of thinking about the procession as an opportunity to actually think about sorrow and biometrics connection with what Misha was talking about with necropolitics, right? Biometric technologies are the world's number one border security technology, and kind of thinking about how that you know biometric technologies then contribute to a certain form of like hyper nationalism by policing borders, but also right contribute to um, the deaths of people considering to transgress those borders. So this was kind of a opportunity to meditate on the sadness and sorrow of biometrics. And so, um, They say we're sick. The year I gained a breast, my mother lost one to breast cancer. The year I gained my voice, my mother was losing hers to Alzheimer's. Made worse by chemo and 20 years of antipsychotics for her schizophrenia, the doctors say we're sick, me and my mom. We each take our pills every day from little amber bottles, but I don't feel sick. And that gives me some feeling of solidarity or empathy or something that I don't have words for, for my mom. It makes me wonder if she feels sick. I remember her smile when I last visited her in North Carolina, which I can't do often. Laughing with her, I started to relate to her in a new way, as a person, as a femme who wore poodle skirts and now who uses a wheelchair, who loved my Colombian dad and his thick accent. Getting in the car, my mom, held my hand in hers and said, we have almost the same color of nail polish on. In a way, we're all sick, but we're also all caretakers. Family members, chosen and biological, and we're all there for one another in need or to offer help in a society that would leave each of us in isolation. We're finding ways of existing together, interdependent, and however difficult it may be at times with love. In an article discussing Leah T's fall advertising campaign for Da Vinci and Lady Gaga's fashion shoot as Joe Calderon in Vogue Om, the New York Times declared 2010 will be remembered. The New York Times declared 2010 will be remembered as the year of the transsexual. 
What is lost in the transgender movement's increasing mainstream success, and who is left behind? How does the media representation of trans people in a positive light serve to normalize and regulate the image of gender nonconformance and, the, and limit the range of political possibility? A disability studies critique is useful here when philo philosopher disability Abby Wilkerson states, intersexualization illustrates the ways in which sexual disabilities are constituted in and through social environments. So one can ask, given that statistics for suicide among transgender people are very high, is being suicidal our condition, or is that condition created by the violence of a transphobic society? Wilkerson points to the desperate need for alliance building between the disability rights movement and the transgender intersex gender queer movements. She calls for a sexual political interdependence, a politics that emphasizes our interdependence as, as allies. Such an alliance allows for a transgender movement that doesn't only follow a normative model of medical transition, but which openly questions the narrative of pathologization that's placed on transgender and gender nonconforming people, and questions the Western biomedical model of medicine that only treats illness instead of focusing on healing and well-being. Well, transgender people can claim a disabled status based on our medical diagnoses and frequent interactions with the medical industrial complex. Such a claim risks appropriation and the diluting of claims for justice from other disabled people. Trans people can work in solidarity or interdependence with disabled people by joining the disability movement strategy of critiquing the authority that defines illness, opening up a decolonization of medicine that can imagine other models of health based in desire and liberation, not illness and correction to norms. At the same time, trans people who identify as disabled should be supported by their communities when they publicly identify as disabled and speak out in solidarity with other kinds of disabilities. I'm sick too. On top of my diagnosis of transsexualism, I was diagnosed with ADHD as a kid and persist in having major, which persists in having a major influence on my life, including having multiple chemical sensitivity and asthma and some other things that are not in the published version of this article. The transgender rights movement can learn from women of color feminism that coalitions are not only essential for success, but recognizing and embracing difference within our movements is key to creating movements that perform the world we want now. The risk of not building solidarity between disability rights and transgender politics is demonstrated by movements such as Occupy Wall Street, whose focus on an economically reductive definition of 99% versus the 1% created a movement in which sexual assault occurred and camps were divided into racial and class ghettos. Queer of color critique builds on women of color feminism to demonstrate how these issues are inseparable. Roger Ferguson in Aberrations in Black states, the decisive intervention of queer of color analysis is that racist practice articulates itself generally as gender and sexual regulation, and that gender and sexual differences variegate racial formations. One can transpose this to state that ableist practice articulates itself as gender and sexual regulation, or transphobic practice articulates itself as a regulation of illness. Either way, such a conjunction helps one understand that the, the need for solidarity between disability activists and gender nonconforming activists is not just strategic, it excavates the roots of our struggle deepening our claims to liberation, opening the way to a decolonial vision of healing justice. Thank you. So we'd like to thank you all for being here, and we'd like to thank Alex for hosting us, and to all the students for engaging with us today. Thank you all.